sort of what North Carolina calls themselves the Tar Heel State. If you don't know, I'm from North Carolina. Uh, they call themselves the Tar Heel State. And where that comes from is, it goes all the way back to the Civil War. Um, so they were trying to move through North Carolina, but they just couldn't get through. They couldn't push the guys in North Carolina. They couldn't push them back. And um, one of the northern leaders of their army, I can't remember who his name is, but he wrote back to his superior in a letter and said it was like the boys in North Carolina had tar in their heels. They just couldn't push them backwards. And so uh, North Carolina apparently was proud of that, and so they call themselves the Tar Heel State. Um, and so that, that, in my mind, is what I connect with God's steadfast love. Because um, sometimes I even struggle with understanding God's steadfast love in my own life. This morning we're going to be talking about um, God's steadfast love um, and His goodness to us. Um, and before I start, uh, I was talking to Ashley about this last night. Uh, I want to just say how thankful I am for everything that God has done for me. Um, I got a call from my grandma. My cousin's having a hard time with something. Uh, he's at a hard point in his life. Um, seems like of his own making. But either way, he's having a hard time. And I was just telling my grandma how thankful I am. I was born into a family that loved me. Um, I grew up in church. Uh, my family communicated how important the gospel was to me uh, my whole life. Um, and I didn't do anything to earn any of that. So I could have been born anywhere. And so I'm so thankful uh, that God chose to bless me with a family uh, like that. Uh, but this morning we'll be in Psalm 136. Um, and again, we're talking about God's steadfast love. Um, and I obviously want to discuss this text, like all texts, uh, the way the author intended, um, way, what he intended for it to mean when he wrote it. Uh, so I believe that the author, when writing this psalm, was writing this because it was overflowing from his heart. What he writes down is just coming out of his heart. Um, and so he wrote this psalm. Um, and one way to illustrate this is how many people in here are parents or grandparents? Um, almost everybody. Uh, how many of you talk about your grandkids or kids to other people? Yeah, almost everyone. Uh, that's because you love your grandkids. You love your kids. Um, it's overflowing from your heart. When they do something good, you want to tell people about it. You're proud of them. Um, I think the psalmist had the same uh, sort of situation here where he's maybe he was thinking about God's steadfast love for a while and he's just overflowing from his heart. He's so thankful. Um, just recognizing God's steadfast love. He writes this psalm. So uh, let's read. I'm going to start reading verse 1, Psalm 136. Is give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. 
To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage. For his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Um, it's clear from reading this psalm that uh, the author has experienced the love of God. Um, and it's possible that all of us have experienced the love of God um, for salvation here. Uh, but sometimes we have a hard time seeing past that. Uh, we understand God loves us. We understand that he wants to save us. We understand the work he did on the cross for us. Um, but sometimes we have a hard time moving past that. Uh, after we're saved, um, we still struggle. We have things going on in our lives. Um, and we have a hard time understanding God's love in those things, in those situations. Um, and one of the first things that comes to my mind when I read this psalm is uh, sort of what North Carolina calls himself the Tar Heel State. If you don't know, I'm from North Carolina. Uh, they call themselves the Tar Heel State. And where that comes from is, it goes all the way back to the Civil War. Um, so they were trying to move through North Carolina, but they just couldn't get through. They couldn't push the guys in North Carolina. They couldn't push them back. And um, one of the northern leaders of their army, I can't remember who his name is, but he wrote back to his superior in a letter and said it was like the boys in North Carolina had tar in their heels. They just couldn't push them backwards. And so uh, North Carolina apparently was proud of that, and so they called themselves the Tar Heel State. Um, and so that, that, in my mind, is what I connect with God's steadfast love. Because um, sometimes I even struggle with understanding God's steadfast love in my own life. Um, but it's like the guys in North Carolina, they just wouldn't move back. No matter what they were doing, this strategy, that way, we're coming around here. They just couldn't get them to move back. They couldn't make any headway into North Carolina. Those guys wouldn't, wouldn't retreat. Um, and in the same way, God's love just doesn't stop. He doesn't stop loving us. Um, his steadfast love endures uh, forever. And so um, today we'll focus on his steadfast love in our lives as believers. Um, we can assume that the author is uh, born again. He's a Christian. Um, that is why it's overflowing from his heart. He is a recipient of steadfast love. Um, there was a time he understood his sin. He's been forgiven. Um, and he believes that God's steadfast love really does endure forever. Um, I think there's three things we see in this psalm that the author is doing. I think he is rejoicing. He's obviously happy about the way God's steadfast love um, has changed his life and changed his future. Um, he's thankful. He's very thankful for God's steadfast love uh, because he did not deserve it, uh, like none of us do. Um, and he is sharing this news. He's sharing about God's steadfast love. Um, obviously, we're reading about it. So <laughs> he wrote it down. He's sharing it. Um, and we see all these in this psalm. But let's look at the works of God's steadfast love that the author shows us in this psalm. Um, so first of all, he talks about creation. And verse one through nine, he says, "Give thanks to the Lord of, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who alone does great wonders, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who by understanding made the heavens, for His steadfast love endures forever. To Him who spread out the earth above the waters." for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, 
for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. And the moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. So we see his love even in creation, um, in the way he's created us. He gave us so many things to enjoy. Even people who are unsaved have so many things in life to enjoy. Um, the first thing that I think of when I think of this topic um, is food. Um, I like to eat. I love food. Uh, God didn't have to make food taste good. Uh, he didn't have to make all, all kinds of things that we experience that are good in life. Um, he didn't have to make it that way. Uh, he, he's blessed us so much even before any of us were born, uh, before he even created humanity. He created the world to be this way. Um, the second thing we see God doing, uh, in this, the author mentions as a display of his steadfast love, is his love that he showed for Israel. Um, this is verse 10 through 24. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever, and brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. So, you may have noticed in reading that, that all of these predicaments that Israel was in, and they needed God's help, was because they had sinned. Um, they had done something wrong, gotten themselves into these problems, and God helped them get out. Uh, that is a, one of the best examples of God's steadfast love, it's just looking at Israel throughout the Bible and throughout their own history. Um, look at all the problems they had of their own making, but God's steadfast love endured through all of it. Um, the third thing we see is common grace, display of common grace, the author mentions in uh, verse 24 through 25, or 26. Um, or actually 25 through 26, I'm sorry. He says, He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. So um, another verse we can look at is Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. It says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So uh, literally just giving food. Um, so talking about sending rain on the just and the unjust, He's talking about rain so they can grow food and eat, and have food to eat. Um, he does that for people who serve him and for the nations that were even fighting against Israel and were not serving him. He even sent rain so they could have food to eat. Um, he caused the sun rise on them just like Israel. Uh, so we see God's common grace on everyone. Um, that is steadfast love. As they're actively living in sin against God, um, he's still... Uh, allows them to live. Um, because of this, we are thankful with the psalmist. Uh, we recognize all these things. We recognize God's steadfast love. We can see it in this psalm as well as in other parts of the Bible. Um, but in our own lives, this is where we often miss that. Uh, we have so much thankfulness for Christ, what he did on the cross. Um, he bought our salvation. We have so much thankfulness for that. Um, but in some ways, we somehow see this, his work on the cross as only covering our sin prior to our salvation. Um, when we make the decision, I'm now a Christian, all the sin before that is covered, but then we somehow feel worse about the sin after that. So 
we know we'll never have a perfect repentance um, until we're with Christ in glory. Uh, we'll never have a perfect repentance. Uh, we'll go on, unfortunately, doing things we don't want to do, and we don't do the things we do want to do. Um, that, that's the story of every Christian. Um, but when we, whenever we do mess up and we have struggles in this life as Christians, we feel much worse, it seems. A lot of people feel much worse about that than they did about their sin before they were saved. Um, we feel like we let God down. Um, sometimes we think, God has done so much for me, how can I go on sinning? Um, how can we do this to him again? Uh, sometimes we feel like it's like we're putting him back on the cross again. Um, and we just go, we get so down on ourselves, um, feeling terrible about ourselves. And uh, we get into what Paul Washer calls it the hockey mindset. Um, Paul Washer is a Southern Baptist pastor. Um, I think he's a good preacher. Uh, he uses this illustration in a, a lot of his sermons. Um, he compares it to hockey. So he says, we put ourselves in the penalty box. Um, we're Christians. We're living for God. We mess up. We maybe have a whole month of messing up. There's a whole month we just have been not what we want to be. And so we put ourselves in the penalty box. Um, and we stay there. We feel far from God. We feel like we can't go before God until we get back to what we used to be or get back maybe to what we should be. Um, and we want to wait there in the penalty box until we've done a significant amount of mourning. Uh, we feel bad for what we've done. Uh, we feel like we've paid for what we did. Um, and then we feel like maybe we can come back to God, but he's got his eye on us. Um, I think a lot of people get into that mindset. Um, but this is not the voice of God. Um, saying you can't go to God after what you did. How could you do that? Um, it, and we even find a way to use Christ's work on the cross against ourselves. Um, we understand what Christ went through on the cross. Uh, we understand what that means. And so that even makes us feel worse about what we've done. And we use Christ's work on the cross for us. We somehow find a way to use it against ourselves in our own minds. Um, there's always a conflict. There's always a conflict between the Holy Spirit and our own sinful nature, our own mind, our own heart. Um, we can always know that these thoughts are not from the Holy Spirit because they are telling us to run away from God instead of running to Him. Um, so let's look again about what the author has to say about this. So I'm going to read verse 10 through 24 really quick. I'm just going to read uh, the first parts of the verses. It says, To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, to him who divided the Red Sea in two, and made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, to him who led his people through the wilderness, to him who struck down great kings and killed mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel his servant. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state and rescued us from our foes. So, if you think back, why are the people of Israel in Egypt? It's because of the sin of Joseph's brothers. Um, Joseph's brothers didn't like Joseph. They threw him in a pit, left him to die. All of a sudden, these people come. They're buying slaves. They say, might as well make some money off of them. They sell them as a slave into Egypt. Um, and that, that's the whole reason they're in Egypt. But even God even redeemed that circumstance, this family tragedy. God even redeemed that. Um, and he used Joseph's position in Egypt to save the nation of Israel through a famine. Um, Joseph had food for him, and they ended up surviving. So how, how much more, if we have been saved by grace and grafted into God's family, why would he deal any differently with us? Um, he's, we see all throughout the Bible of God redeeming Israel, redeeming their mistakes. The whole reason they're in Egypt is because of sin. And he even takes them out of Egypt when they pray to him. They're crying out. They're in slavery. They don't like it. Uh, God hears their cries, rescues them from Egypt. That's what the whole book of Exodus is about. Um, if he did that with them time and time and time again, 
Why would he deal differently with us? Um, what does a shepherd do with his sheep who have gone astray? He pulls them back to where they're supposed to be. So, in the same way, Christ does this with us. Uh, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So when we get in our own head and we hear ourselves telling us we can't go to God after this, uh, we've messed up again. Maybe you have this sin that comes back every once in a while and you say, I can't believe I did this again. I, I don't even want to go to God and pray about it. You just feel so bad. Um, that is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit is telling you, run to God. If you've sinned, you must go to God. Um, and go to Him before He gets to you, because He is coming. Uh, he, won't, he won't let you run away, but for so long. If you are a child of God, um, if you belong to Him, He will discipline you. Um, he's coming to bring you back. So run to Him before He gets to you. Uh, the Holy Spirit is telling you, turn to God. Uh, don't put yourself in the penalty box. Uh, this is steadfast love. Uh, we do have a responsibility to repent. Um, we have to get that straight. We do have a responsibility to repent. But only through Christ in us. Um, without Christ, we couldn't repent. Um, there's no way we could do it. We must walk with Him. Um, so, how do we respond to this psalm? Psalm 136, we see God's steadfast love. How do we respond? Uh, I think we respond the same way we see the author responding to God's steadfast love. He's rejoicing. Uh, I think this shows itself practically in worship. Um, we're rejoicing in the steadfast love that we experience and the benefits of it. I think this plays out practically in worship. So we worship God um, in church and at home. Uh, we are thankful. Thanksgiving. Um, we tell God all the time. I tell God all the time. Um, when I'm reminded of my sin, thank you so much, not only for forgiving me for my sin, but helping me to not do it next time. So there's so many times I'm tempted, I can pray to God and He helps me stay away from sin. Um, thank Him for that as well, um, and sharing. So we share this good news with the world. Uh, the world needs God's steadfast love, um, whether they realize it or not. They need it, not only for salvation, but there's so much pain in the world. There's so much pain. Um, people, you might not even know about stuff people's going through. I'm sure many times we don't. Uh, but they need someone who loves them. Um, part of what I was talking to my grandma about on the phone was, I'm so thankful that God gave me this family and all these blessings in my life. But even if something happened to them, even if something terrible happened to all of them, they were gone. Um, even if I lose my job, everything good in my life is gone. I still have a God who loves me. Um, he will always love me. And I know that. Uh, I can't imagine people who go through tragedies who don't have that. Uh, they don't have ultimate hope. They don't, have, they don't know that there's a God who loves them and who will always love them. Uh, no matter what I do, God will always love me. So we have to share that with the world. They need it. Um, and they want it, whether they realize it or not. Um, and if you, if you struggle with understanding God's grace, um, like I do at times, I struggle with understanding God's grace. Um, I encourage you to read this psalm regularly. It's pretty short. You heard me read it, probably three minutes maybe it took me. Um, I would read this regularly and pray that God would help you to see his love for what it really is instead of what we create it to be in our own mind, um, our own mind affected by sin. Um, so rejoice in God's steadfast love. Thank him for his steadfast love and share it with others. Um, share it with other unbelievers. Share it with other believers as well. Um, encourage each other. I'm going to pray and then uh, turn it back over to Pastor Paul. Father, we're so thankful for your steadfast love in all of our lives, um, in the life of this church as a whole. Uh, you've blessed us all so much. We ask that you would help us to remember this as we go through our lives, Father. Help us to remember your steadfast love, um, that you will never stop loving us. Help us to remember your goodness. 
and to rely on you instead of our own, um, our own works. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this time. Uh, we get to look into your word together. Please uh, give us a great rest of the day, a safe day. In your son's name, amen.